All right, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the first Map Mentor Monday. Um, so we do this series with um, the hope that we can highlight some of our um, past experience tips that we wish that we know before going to medical school, things like that. So before introducing our esteemed panel, I'd like to set up the discussion for this uh, Met Mentor Monday, and then uh, we'll introduce them. Um, so today is more like an overview for being a for the path to being a pre-med, which is a very long and very difficult one. But we're here to help you. So um, just to have some of the things and maybe the themes that we might discuss later um, during this talk and as well for the other session as well, we will have topics on academics requirements, which for those of you who go to UCLA, there is this worksheet that you can visit on our website. For people who don't go to UCLA, this can be a great reference track guide for you as well. Uh, the requirements stay mostly the same. Um, there's some variation, like some school require biochemistry or some school requires psych or SOCH, but that's really depend on your uh, medical score of interest. And then there's also extracurricular activities we will briefly touch upon today as well. There are three different topics that we always think about when we select our extracurricular activities, which is research, clinical and non-clinical. And on top of that, there's also MCAT and then gap years. And then when applying, it is a very intensive endeavors, as you can see here. Um, it actually start a year and a half before matriculation. So you have to start thinking about letter of rec, essays beginning of January, and then applications is June, July, August, but then mostly the essays are due, then interviews, this is just not happening until, well, I mean, for some people it will happen really early, like October, but for many it might not happen until March, April, May of the following year before starting medical school in August. So with all of that, um, there's resources that you can utilize, your major or minor counselors. We have a, at UCLA, we have pre-health services and our websites here that you can always visit, family and friends. And also if you don't go to UCLA, be sure to talk to your school. So with that, uh, let's introduce to our panelists right here. I would like to love to know your name. Where do you go for undergrad? Uh, what's your major? Do you take any gap years? And what's your current status at UCLA? So go for it. Uh, we'll go in alphabetical order by last name. So Mario, you're first. Cool beans. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mario Eusebio. I am a current MS1 in the UCLA Prime LA program. I went to, I was a community college student. So I started out in community college at Diablo Valley College and then I transferred over to UC Berkeley. And then I graduated with a degree in integrative biology. Thank you, Mario. Maria? Hello everyone. My name is Maria Luna. I'm a current second year here at Dave and Gavin School of Medicine, a traditional path um, I graduated back in 2016 uh, from Brown University with a double concentration in biology and Egyptology, BA, so took quite a number of gap years before going here and was also a reapplicant. So went through this rodeo of being, you know, applications twice. <laughs> Glad to have you here with us. Uh, Julie? Hi, everyone. My name is Juliana, or you can call me Julie. Um, I am a first year medical student here at DGSOM, also a traditional track. Um, I graduated from Tufts University. I did a double major in biology and sociology. And then I ended up taking two gap years, uh, one of them to do my master's in public health. Um, yeah. Awesome. And Randy. Hi, all. My name is Randy. Uh, I'm a current MS2 in the traditional DGSOM program, graduated from UC San Diego in 2019, uh, studied a double major there in anthropology and also in general biology, um, also studied art history, and then ended up doing a master's in biology um, because I wasn't originally a pre-med, um, and now I'm here. All right, thanks everyone. And I'm Nguyen, I am currently in my research here between third and fourth year, and I will be the moderator. Um, so let's first talk about the big umbrella topic first. Many people want or is curious about when do you know you want to be a pre-med? Is there a certain experience that lets you to where you're at? 
Um, so this first question will be open discussion. Um, so please feel free. I think it really does depend. Um, it's just so individualized when you first feel like you're gonna go on this journey to becoming a physician. You know, uh, personally for me, I, I did know kind of from a very young age, you know, my mom told me that ever since like kindergarten, I wanted to be a vet. So I was kind of already in that like medicine realm, even as a little kid. Uh, but it wasn't until like eighth grade career day when I saw the like some options of like, hmm, who do I want to hear talk? And I chose FBI. I chose like a singer. And then I saw something random called neonatologist. I'm like, what the heck is that? Looked it up in the dictionary. And it's like, oh, something to do with babies. Cool. And so like after hearing that, that's what really kind of solidified me. And I've been like pre-med ever since that eighth grade day. Um, but, you know, things happen. So it's like when I went to college, I went to the East Coast for the first time. It was like being outside California, the culture shock. So it's like when I was there, I knew, OK, I'm going to do like pre-med rec stuff, but I'm not going to really do any clinical experience or anything like that until I come back to California. And that's when I like I took all my gap years and like solidified all my things. Uh, I can go next. So. Uh, in community college, I originally thought I was going to do pre-nursing, so I finished all my pre-nursing -re pre prereqs, and I actually took an anatomy class where I actually ended up becoming the TA, so I was able to basically lead, like, human cadaver dissection sessions, and it wasn't until I met a couple of my, uh, you know, good friends who were re-entry students um, who convinced me, because at the time, uh, when I was a TA, I think I was only, like, 18, and so they were like, you're 11 teen, you should try to shoot for the stars and go become an MD. And I was like, cool. And what really solidified sort of my interest in medicine is actually I started working at, my, so I'm originally from the Bay Area, um, at my uh, county coroner's office. So I worked for Contra Costa County Sheriff's Department in the coroner's division. So I would assist forensic pathologists performing autopsies. And there wasn't really any discretion in the cases that I saw. So I would see individuals from or assist in cases and do autopsies for individuals who were from, you know, infancy all the way to individuals to geriatric age and everywhere in between. And it was really what I would say that was my sort of formative um, idea of wanting to go into medicine. It just happened to be that my mentor at the time, the friends pathologist, also just happened to be um, a physician of color from, from Nigeria. So that was the first time I actually met a uh, physician um, of color who, who ended up being my mentor has been a good mentor of mine for the, the better half of a decade now and then since then it was just more of refining what i want to do in this field of medicine and getting these experiences to understand you know ultimately where i see myself and what i want to do for my future career path but that what i would say is where um, i decided to pursue medicine um, in community college I can also talk a little bit on that. Actually, similar to Maria, I was really interested. I like always wanted to be a vet when I was a kid. Um, I didn't have like as much of, I didn't grow up being like, I'm going to be a doctor, but there were like definitely a lot of defining moments in my own childhood and like assisting with like my own family when it went to going to doctor's appointments, like translating, especially because like we're really a primarily Spanish speaking household. So uh, being involved in all of that process and a, a couple other like things from my background, like kind of shifted me from the vet perspective more to the medicine perspective. So once I started undergrad, I knew that I was going in pre-med. Um, I felt pretty strongly about that. Um, and like went and did my requirements that way um, and like kind of solidified it more as I also found mentors like different interests and also people who were like along for the ride with me. <laughs> I can add in a little bit too. Um, I think really for me it wasn't one particular event that sort of made me realize that yes I want to be a physician um, it was sort of a culmination of just life experience um, I mentioned earlier that during college I had not originally planned to be a pre-med um, I was sort of just exploring different things because I had no idea what I wanted to do with my future um, tried a little bit of engineering tried a little bit of consulting tried a little bit just you know everything all across the board um, and just really found that I wasn't fully 
satisfied by anything I had tried. There's always just this part that was missing and I didn't know what really it was um, until I sat back one day and sort of thought about, you know, all the things I'm sort of involved in and all the things I'm passionate about. Um, always wondering, you know, why is healthcare so difficult for folks to access? Why was it so difficult for family members to access? Um, and then realizing that maybe I wanted to try and, you know, step into that world um, and try to do what I can. Um, and so started to do a couple of different things, whether that was research or clinical experience, um, and then ultimately added all that together and realized that, um, yes, the medicine is what I wanted to do, even though it would take a little bit longer to get there. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. So um, I guess the next question is like, once you decide that this is something that you want to do, you eventually have to think about classes and pre-requirements for school. I think all four of you are in some ways have a biology components to it. I think three of you have a double major. Uh, so let's talk about major selections. Was there a reason for what you're interested in biology or something else that you're considering? Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Mario. And then uh, we'll branch to double measuring. So initially, actually, when I came in to transfer at Cal, I was a double major in applied mathematics and molecular cell biology. And so I took, I think, biophysical chemistry and abstract algebra for a semester and said, peace out to applied math. And I didn't do so well <laughs> um, in biophysical chemistry because it turns out I didn't, I didn't actually take my uh, physics course at community college, so I had to take it in Cal. They didn't actually tell me that I need physics for, it's in the name, but I just thought that it'd be okay. It did not turn out okay. And so I actually didn't want to repeat um, biophysical chemistry at Cal. So I ended up looking for the next best thing, which was integrated biology, which would allow me to basically progress through um, Cal with the least amount of um, uncertainty is the best way that I could put it. And so when I was, that's what uh, led me to uh, majoring in integrative biology. I didn't know about um, public health at the time when I was transferring. And so there's a process at Cal where you have to apply to be a public health major prior and I already had passed that. So if I were to go back again and pick my major, um, honestly, it probably would have been public health or Japanese to be honest with you, or maybe bio E if I stuck with the math stuff. <laughs> I suppose for me, uh, if I could go back and do it again, I honestly just would have stuck with Egyptology for to have fun. Cause that's like the thing with Brown. It's like, you can kind of do anything. It's like, there's very few requirements needed to actually get a concentration. Um, and the only reason I really ended up doing biology too was because I let, I didn't really know any better. I didn't really have any mentors. I kind of just was figuring out the pre-med journey on my own. And I kind of just always saw, you know, on forums and stuff like, oh, biology major, that's just the thing you do, right? Um, and then the Egyptology major is like, yeah, I just technically have to take like 10 required courses and that's it. And I, I get my Egyptology major. But yeah, going back and doing it all over again, it would be like, there was really no point for me to do the biology major because at the end of the day, it's just like doing the prereq stuff. But if, yeah, I would just have more fun with like uh, other outside classes first, especially since I was like so out of my comfort zone. I think Randy, Julie, you also did something in sociology, anthropology too as well, right? Do you want to comment on those and then what major would you have chosen looking back? Yeah, totally. I think I, I also agree with uh, Maria that in the sense of like, I didn't fully, I really liked the understanding of science. Like I was really curious about the science piece. And also like, I didn't know, you know, like I went in and was like, biology sounds right, you know, for a pre-med major. Um, and it was interesting, but like, and, and I was really curious about it, but it wasn't like my dying passion. <laughs> like, I think it just kind of was something I settled into. Um, and then sociology was actually what I found interest in as I went. And, and it was like, came from like a, a passion standpoint a little bit um, more so like I took a medical sociology class uh, that they offered at my school. And that was 
a big like eye-opening moment for me where I was like okay this is a really cool I really like connecting with people I like understanding populations like I like knowing more about how our like world works and why and why these communities are a certain way why we're a certain way you know and um I found a lot of like interest and passion in that um and so I really stuck on to that and it worked out really well. I mean, my my biology major also, what was useful was that it, it helped a lot with the pre-med requirements because a lot of the biology requirements overlapped with the pre-health requirements. Um, and then the, the sociology piece, I mean, there was some navigating there because there was no overlap. Like it'll be useful a little bit for your MCAT, but like there was no overlap with bio or anything else. So it was like completely separate career with a lot more classes, but um, I, I second the fact that like, yes, definitely like pre-med is something cool to get a head start on and, and do, but also like take this time to be curious, like take really fun classes, like take really weird stuff, like, like stuff that like you find entertaining, like stuff that you're passionate about. Um, that's kind of how I stumbled upon sociology because I had never really, I, if someone had asked me what sociology was back then, I would have never known, you know? So uh, I, I really enjoyed it that way and it worked out well. Yeah, I guess similar for me um, at UC San Diego, we sort of have to choose a major by the end of our second year. Um, and at that point, I had not decided what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't like math. I knew I didn't like computers. Um, didn't love, love English lit or anything like that. And so I was just struggling really hard. Um, remember taking a class in anthropology and um, how much people talked about monkeys and I love monkeys. So um, I just thought that was super, super fun. So I decided to be an anthropology major. Um, turns out that we, you know, would spend literally days of each week at the San Diego Zoo um, just staring at monkeys. So that was great and so much fun. Um, and also really cool because it introduced me to global health. Um, from that perspective and sort of from global health, I started thinking more about health in general um, and then ultimately picked up a biology major just because I was still at the end of graduating. I didn't really know if I wanted to go into medicine, but I knew I loved teaching. And so I originally was going to do a science education minor and biology sort of fit in well with that. Um ultimately didn't do well um, in that. And so that sort of led into me pursuing a master's in biology and trying to do more work there. Um, but I fully agree with what Mario wrote in the chat. Um, absolutely, absolutely do not feel like you have to major into sciences to be pre-med. Um, actually choose what you like. Um, if I could have gone back, I would not have done the entire biology major. I would have just done the prereqs. Um, and then spent the rest of my time exploring other things that I actually enjoyed um, outside of the sciences. So it seems like the idea is that instead of trying to fit into this mold, you just do one major and then have time to do something else while also completing the pre-med requirements, which I mean, it's a lot, but as long as you enjoy what you're doing, right? Um, but what about for people Maybe this is more of a biased question because I came from engineering school. Um, so for the people who are dead scared of topics like chemistry, uh, mathematics, engineering, um, there's always discussion about GPA, um, how they might not be too favorable, but then if that's something that they really enjoy, what is your opinions on doing a topic that and may be difficult, but maybe very interesting to the students? What is your thought on that? Do I have to go first? <laughs> you don't have to. Um, I can go first, but I'm a moderator, so I'm trying to not to interject myself. So, just to just to uh, paraphrase, you're you're asking, you know, if if you if students are interested in taking other classes that are outside of their major that are in the harder sciences or just taking classes in general. So I was just curious about what the question was. The, the question, so they can, it can be either a very interesting class, like, I don't know, quantum mechanics or something, or it can be a, a, a whole different major, like an engineering major. Mm -hmm. um, so what is your opinion on class selection or major selection when it comes to 
like GPA, path to med school later, and things like that? I, I would highly suggest, um, now that I understand your question, to take classes that you are, you know, really interested in. Probably one of the classes that was really interesting to me that I took was actually not even in the sciences. It was the, I think it was uh, Introduction to Health Policy and Administration. And it was something that was completely, you know, not in the sciences at all, but more in the realm of public health. And that actually taught me more about the medical field and gave me a better understanding of what goes on on a more macroscopic level and helped me understand like when I was working in clinics and I was working with different allied health professionals and providers, you know, like, for example, like how insurance works, how doctors get paid, it really gave me insight into a different realm of the medical field that they're not going to teach you, I mean, in medical school, and you either learn that through experience or you take classes like this. So in regards to taking those particular classes, you know, especially for the science classes, you know, um, choose the ones that you're really interested in and just do well on the pre-med prereqs. Like any of those upper division science courses that you have to take, right? They're, yeah, they're important, but the main thing is to do well on your pre-med prereqs. Yeah, and even at the end of the day, I mean, when it comes to GPA, yes, it's important, but it's only one factor out of so many that gets considered. So there's like different like schools of thought regarding it, right? There's like, you know, especially your first year, even your second year, that's the time you're taking to explore all these classes that you're interested in. Because I mean, if you end up getting, you know, a GPA that's not so stellar in those early years, that's okay because then you, you still have two years to course correct and have that coveted upward trend. Um, then there's, you know, people like me who had more of a roller coaster. And that's okay too, you know, <laughs> after I didn't get in the first time, I just did a year of do-it-yourself post back classes and crushed it, you know? So it's like, sometimes it's like, um, it's, it, it kind of depends. Um, and just like realizing there's like, yes, GPA is important. So you do, if you can, you know, do your best while you're an undergrad. So that way you don't necessarily have to worry about like GPA correction and post backs and things like that, or doing a master's, but also, just know if you're early on in your undergrad, it's okay to not have like the most stellar GPA. And just to echo that, one thing I will say, like, I think also if you find things that you're really interested in and really love, you're bound to do better in them in, in the sense that like, I mean, that won't always be the case. There will be some really tough classes, but like in general, like you'll be way more interested and more engaged and like it, it just will like, like that, that will get you through for sure. And then in the sense of the GPA, like, and yes, GPA is important, but honestly, like, I don't fully believe that. I think that like a lot of the med school process has become a lot more holistic. You won't see that with every single school. Like it's not across the board, but I would say like a lot more of the schools are so much more holistic in how they look at students. Um, holistic being like, they look at your story, your essays, like what you've done, what your interests are. That's kind of like the holistic is the word they use for this whole process a lot. Um, but me personally, like even in my pre-med requirements, there were like two or three classes where I got really bad grades. And I was going through, there was like a tough period in my life as well. But like, I'm telling you like bad grades, I won't like say it in the Zoom, but like, if you want to reach out to me, feel free. Like, I'm not ashamed. I just feel weird about it being recorded. But like, I am happy to talk more about it. Do not be afraid. Like, don't let that intimidate you. Like, don't let that stop you. Like, that number is not going to define you like your story matters and like it's it's worth trying and there's a lot of other things that they look at um so like I said I think really go with things that you care about because I think that's what shines through the most when you go to apply like what did you care about like what do you want to do like how are you helping yourself to help others you know Yeah, I agree full heartedly with what Julie was saying, um, especially with grades. If if grades was the most important thing, I would not be sitting here today. Um, I, I think it's just, um, of course, if you have, you know, higher grades, it definitely does help to some sort of extent. Um, I will say that because my grades weren't the best, it took me a little bit longer to sort of get here. 
um, just because my grades were so poor that I had to do extra classes just to be eligible um, to apply. So I'll let you imagine what that GPA looks like. Um, but I think the important part is what everyone was sort of mentioning before is just doing something that you're really passionate about. Um, I think more, more so doing things that you yourself enjoy rather than what you think other people might want to see um, from you. Um, that really has been my feeling, um, especially around folks at UCLA um, Medical School, um, is that a lot of folks engaged in things that they themselves really enjoy rather than thought about, you know, is this something that I have to do because everyone else is sort of doing that type of stuff. Um, so just get involved in what your passion is, whatever that is. It does not have to be medicine related. I guess going along the line of grades, there's an interesting question from the chat. Uh, so the question is, what is considered a good GPA um, in your opinion? I think that the threshold kind of changed depending on the school, but the, the follow-up is actually, is there a point of diminishing return in terms of GPA? So I'm going to say for all of you who are still undergrads that are still here, like academic remediation is the most expensive thing that you're going to have to do postgraduately. So if you don't do well in your undergrad right now, it just means that it might take you a little bit longer to, you know, uh, apply to medical school and get that particular GPA. I'll be real. I don't mind if this is recorded. <laughs> My first semester at Cal, I got a 1.35 or some crazy stuff like that where I was put on academic probation. So that means that I had to spend the rest of my time at Cal turning that 1.35 into something. I graduated with a 3.01, which is still, you know, not at that particular threshold. So I had to take uh, multiple classes at UC Berkeley Extension to boost up my GPA. And that was expensive. Like those classes are not cheap. There was no financial aid once you graduate as an undergrad. So I was, I was really lucky that I was a full-time employee at Cal where I had a, there was a sponsored tuition program at the time and I was able to take those classes. But if not, I would have been having to drop like 1,200 to 1,100 $100 per class. So if you have the ability and the time to do well now in undergrad, do it now because it'll it'll add up. Uh, Postgraduately, there's no financial aid and you're going to have to be taking out loans and with all honesty. And if you're someone like me where finances were an issue and who had to basically work all throughout undergrad, right, that's something that you definitely have to take into consideration. So I echo what everyone is saying, that GPA isn't an, a very uh, all-defining factor. There are multiple parts to your application that individuals consider to be you know, a good medical school applicant, but it is one of those things that will you know, get you in the door, right? And there are other ways to show that you would be a good medical student aside from just academics. So is there like a certain threshold, let's say that, um someone, I'm just going to throw this out there. Let's say that three, five, right? So if a student is below three, five, they need to focus more on the classes and then drop certain activities, or is the threshold going to be a little lower or higher? What's going to be your opinion on that? Just to make sure that everyone, as, as you mentioned, got a decent shot at going to medical school without having to spend too much outside of um, postgraduate. Is that a 3.5 science GPA or a 3.5 like overall GPA? Let's just say cumulative GPA. I would take that in a heartbeat, <laughs> to be honest with you. Like if you got a 3.5 and you're in UCLA, you're doing a pretty pretty good job. You know what I mean? You don't need like a 4.0, right? And that's, that's my two cents on it, right? If you could get like a 3.5, 3.3, right? As long as it's above a 3.0, um, if it is, then, you know, you might need to take postgraduate classes. Like when I took classes, when I applied um, the second time, my post bag GPA was a 3.7. So it just depends on whether you want to put in that time after you graduate, whether you want to put in the time taking classes or actually exploring the medical field and refining what you want to do uh, once you get to medical school. So it's just um, a give or take at that point. Randy, since you also mentioned about classes and taking it post-grad, do you have any thoughts on the cutoff for that? Uh, yeah, um, I definitely am no advisor, so I, I don't have to have the real answers for this. Um, I think at the time, what my sort of pre-health advisors or other folks around me sort of mentioned was 
you know, if you're sort of under a 3-3, maybe consider taking extra classes to raise that up a little bit. 3-5 um, is sort of where, you know, you sort of have to decide if that's something that you want to do. There might be diminishing returns. Um, I would say anything above a 3-7, definitely diminishing returns to actually take more classes. Um, but we'll heavily emphasize what Mario mentioned earlier about the finances. Uh, finances are so, so real for folks. Um, and it can be a really hard time to sort of figure out how to work around doing, you know, affording classes while also needing to take extra classes. Um, and one thing that I also wanted to mention was that um, for me, this is something I didn't know, but um, I took a master's. Uh, I did a master's afterwards because my sort of thought going into the process was that if I did a master's program, maybe that would help boost up my GPA. Um, but the master's program is actually separate of a GPA from your undergraduate GPA. Um, and so in my situation, because I was under the cutoff for a lot of schools to apply to school, my master's classes would not have helped me at all, even if I got a 4.0 in all of them. Um, and so I was just fortunate because at UC San Diego, we're able to audit undergraduate courses while we're a master's student. Um, but just be a little bit aware of that, that if it's really some sort of you know GPA repair that you got to do to hit some sort of eligibility mark, um, that you're either doing post back classes or you're doing what's called a quote unquote special master's program, um, because those will go under um, your undergraduate GPA. Oh, and I was just going to add real quickly, you also have to be careful when you're doing that grade repair to check to see what the policies are for each school, because sometimes they, they'll say different things like, oh, we do accept online classes, or we don't, just depending on like what their specific regulations are for like when, when COVID was happening and all of that, but some like might have rolled that back. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. So uh, we're going to bridge a little bit away from academics because I think we we'll, we talked about how important the rest of the application is and the holistic package that medical school will look at. So I think when I think about extracurricular activities, there's three buckets. There's research, the clinical, and there's non-clinical. Um, as you have your resume, which is very impressive. So um, let's talk about some of the activities you are involved with. I Let's start with Maria, actually. I think you, you briefly mentioned about um, doing clinical work and you kind of save that until you return to California. Was there like a point where you think it may be beneficial during college, after college, you consider volunteering versus job in a clinical setting and how it might impact your application to medical school? Yeah, so like during college, like I had a job, like I worked as like a library shelving uh, person. Um, I was involved in choir. Um, I didn't do like any research or any of that. So I was saving the research and the clinical experience for like after I graduated and was back in California and kind of in like my zone that I was more familiar with. So yes, once I graduated, got back here, I just, I knew right away, okay, I need to get clinical experience, but also I can't afford to just do volunteering. I need to get a job. So I decided to get my certified uh, nursing assistant because that was like the cheapest thing I could see to get at the time because I, I just took a community college course. So it was like relatively inexpensive compared to like sometimes like the medical assistant courses can get more pricey or things like that. Um, so and yeah, just like started working as a certified nursing assistant and through there uh, was able to find like a mentor and a doctor kind of took me under his wing and I was able to then start working at his family medicine practice um, and then just cold emailed a bunch of like different labs at like UCSD and UCR to see like okay well that's a, that's something I kind of have to like check off do some research but um, I knew I didn't want to do anything like traditionally like wet lab kind of research because that sounded boring to me so I was like cold emailing like the sociology the psychology labs to find something of interest and then I got matched with something at UCR and that was really cool was able to do that for four years and then outside of those kind of like more traditional pre-med stuff it's like okay well what am I doing kind of like for me that I enjoy doing and so one of those things was continuing the singing that I had been doing in like Catholic church choirs I've been doing that since high school continued it at Brown and then was able to continue that at a, like a local church um and so that was like just something that's like you know beneficial for me because it was like I, I like singing <laughs> and you know I, I felt like great peace doing that um and then also like fun stuff too like I even 
like, you know, I like playing video games. I like playing Dungeons and Dragons, you know, all those tabletop RPGs as well. Like started those up in college and continued it a little bit afterwards too. And heck, talking about tabletop RPGs even ended up as one of my hobbies on my med school application. So it's like anything goes, you know? <laughs> and yeah, also did a little bit of volunteering then like during COVID with the whole um, kind of like a online tutor for like K through 12 students. Thanks, Maria. A lot to unpack, but I think there's different umbrellas, as you can see, where we kind of have to check off the, the boxes. I think it was one box that I was hoping to address as well, as like shadowing versus volunteering. I think, Julie, you did some of that before. You talked about, like, what do you think it's like, some people think that there's a number they have to hit for shadowing and things like that. Do you want to discuss your experience with shadowing versus clinical volunteering? Which you, one do you think is beneficial as well? Totally. I think I also, like many of you probably feel now, felt that pressure of checking off those boxes, which is is really difficult because I, I hope that you all don't limit yourselves to that um, because there is a lot that you can do also in your personal interest that shows commitment and interest. I think the most important part with both like volunteering and shadowing is literally understanding what you don't like. I think it's even more important than knowing what you like, honestly, because you go in and you, it's, it's much easier to be like, oh, not for me, you know? And I think in terms of how it differed a little bit with the volunteering and the shadowing was at least for me, like my undergrad at Tufts offered like a surgical shadowing program, because that was something that I was super interested in through, um, like during my undergrad, and that was a really awesome experience. Uh, it, it gives you a little bit of a different insight than volunteering because uh, you're you're there almost to learn and to follow around. You're not really contributing as much. Um, but like I said, it gives you an understanding of what you like and what you don't like, which is super important. Um, I didn't do that many hours. It was like a one week program. And other than that, I, I will admit, especially in my institution, it was kind of hard to get shadowing experience like like there were some things we could participate in but it was pretty limited um the volunteering was uh pretty open uh and I did a lot more hours in terms of volunteering so I used to be like a patient transport transporter um at a really big hospital in Boston um at Brigham and Women's so I did a lot of like patient and specimen transport I would say that one to me was more personally rewarding um, and also another way to see what I liked and what I didn't like in terms of hospital aspect, like in terms of working with patients, in terms of like seeing different specialties, like based off of where I would take the patients. Um, but that one was a little bit more fulfilling for me because I like a lot of the patient facing um, things. So I like interacting a lot with people. I like hearing their stories. I like hearing what they need for me. Like I like being in, like someone that they can like count on and like feel comfortable with. So I really enjoyed that specific volunteering experience. Um, and I, I got a lot out of it, even just on like a personal, like personal like love way you know like it, it it made me feel really good about things that I was doing um so both are pretty different experiences I wouldn't say like for that volunteering experience specifically uh because I did other random stuff that one was usually about three hours a week um once a week uh I would go in for my hospital shift uh and then, yeah, the shadowing program was a little bit more sporadic it was like one one week intensive um that I did for like 40 hours because it was like a full week. Um, so I don't fully know in terms of like how many hours you would need for either. I think what was most valuable for me was just understanding what I liked, what I didn't like, what I got out of it. And it helped me check off some boxes, I guess, to give me peace of mind, because I'm sure like, I know I say that you don't have to think about the boxes, but I know everyone's thinking about the boxes because it's stressful. So if that's something that's for you, like I didn't do it in aggressive amounts of hours either. Um, so. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, I think people mentioned that it's really about how you shine through the interviews by how you talked about your activities, your your passions for it, your involvement, your roles, which we always look for examples. And so if you're involved in these things and be really like a strong contributor, I think they will come through. Um, so I think it's eight. So I want to be respectful of our time um, of our panelists as well as of our attendees. 
Any last word of wisdom, things that you wish that you know before we say goodbye to our uh, session? I guess one thing I want to say, I just want to remind you all that you deserve to be here. You deserve to be what to be doing what you want to do. And I hope that you all find kindness and self-compassion because uh, I know it's hard and I know it's these are hard like barriers to go through, um, but you're not alone. And just like, I hope you always go back to your own self-compassion because I know that's something that we stray from because we tend to be really hard on ourselves. So you guys got this, I promise. Yes, just know like if being a physician is what you really want to do, you're going to do it. It doesn't matter how long it takes or what gets in the way, like just stick to that goal. You know, you'll do it. And I would also say like nowadays, take advantage of like social media, medical students all the time are posting like a day in their life. So if you know, you watch it and they say, hey, DM me, you know, it's like, go ahead, take advantage of that. The worst they can do is just not answer. And that way you can also like get a wide variety of perspectives for medical students all over the country, maybe even outside of the US and just to get like those experiences, see what it's like if you're still not sure is this something for me or not. Uh, in regards to advice, you know, um, I really like this quote. It just popped in my head while everyone was talking. But one who has a, a why can endure any how. And you currently are just in a how. And so find connection in everything that you do and relate it back to why you're doing this in the first place. Because that why is what's going to drive you to, you know, maybe take those uh, potential uh, growth years or gap years or to to study and take these difficult classes. You need to be able to tap into that when you're feeling like you don't, you know, when you're questioning if this is the right path for you. And all the activities and everything that you do is just a is accumulation of, of, of that why, right? And be able to, like I said, find connection in what you do and, and anything can be connected back to that why. So when you find yourself really questioning if you belong here or if this is the right path for you, remember why you started and that'll get you through it. All right. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. So I know this is a lot of information. It's going to be just the start of a lot of videos that we are going to have and discussions. So thank you, everyone, for being involved. And we look forward to chat with you guys uh, during the next session of Mentors Mondays. Thank you to the panelists for your time. Greatly appreciate it.